Hi again. Um, I think we'll get started at this point. So thank you very much for joining us again for the July edition of Dragon Trails monthly webinar series. Uh, today we'll be looking at uh, sorry, just to switch the slide. Um, today we'll be looking at the first half of uh, 2018 in review. First, looking at some of the major travel trends in Chinese outbound tourism, um, as well as the digital developments uh, on the Chinese online uh, um, webosphere, and then moving on to the first look at our WeChat rankings for Q2 of 2018. Uh, we just got these rankings in earlier this week, uh, so you will be the very first audience uh, to find out kind of who came out on top and what the biggest themes were for the first half of this year so far. So our webinar will last for maybe about 45 minutes, after which time we will have time for Q&A. Um, for those of you who have joined our webinars in the past, you'll know the routine. Um, we uh, would appreciate it if you ask your questions for Q&A. You can ask those at any time during the webinar, but please ask them using the Q&A button, which you should see on your screen, as opposed to the chat function, um, because the Q&A button will just, it makes it easier for us to keep track of the questions and make sure that we answer them at the end. So today um, I'll be speaking. My name is Sienna Perulis Cook. I'm the communications manager for Dragon Trail Interactive. I'm in charge of all of the content on our blog. Uh, so writing lots of reports on trends in Chinese outbound travel and um, and digital marketing. Um, we've also got Roy Graf, our managing director for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa on hand today. And he'll be um, joining in during the Q&A section to answer any of your questions. So many of you will be very familiar with Dragon Trail and will have attended our webinars in the past. Um, but for any of you who might be new, I'll just introduce the company very briefly. Um, we are a... Um, a digital marketing and also digital solutions company. Um, we're based in China, but have offices in London and the US as well. Um, the work that we do is entirely focused on China, entirely focused on travel, and entirely focused on digital. So this means that we have quite deep understanding um, of this very specific area. Our clients we have clients on six continents, um, and as well as being spread all over the world, um, our clients also come from a number of different travel verticals, including national tourism boards, hotels, airlines, and attractions. So that also gives us a lot of insights into um, different aspects of um, Chinese tourism and the travel experience. So before we get started with this webinar, um, this is our monthly webinar. So um, we've been doing them every month of this year. And if you've missed any of our past webinars, they are all available to watch on YouTube as well as on our website. Um, right here, we have links to all of them. I, I don't know if they'd work if you click on the link um, now during the presentation though. Um, but we will be sharing the presentation deck as also um, a link to the recording of this webinar after today's webinar in the next couple of days. And if you go to our website and go to the resources section, you'll see a section within that called videos and presentations. And that's where you'll be able to watch any of the past webinars from this year, as well as the webinars um, from last year as well. So now we'll get started, uh, first by talking about some of the biggest trends and development in Chinese outbound travel in the first six months of this year so far. So overall, China has been the number one tourism market in the world for several years already. But now we're starting to see China become the number one market in markets that are a little bit farther away from China or perhaps a little bit more niche as well, not just places that are close to China and really popular for Chinese tourists, such as um, Thailand. So this year, for the first time, China overtook New Zealand to become the number one inbound tourism market for Australia. Um, in for Canada, China has not surpassed the U.S. yet. Um, it's not right next to Canada, but it is now uh, Canada's largest long-haul market. And then in even smaller destinations that we might see as quite niche, um, 
China is becoming the leading inbound market, um, such as in Abu Dhabi, um, which um, now it's the leading inbound tourism market. And in all of these markets, we can see that there have been really big increases over the past year. So we would expect this to continue with other destinations around the world as well, um, even destinations that are long haul trips from China um, and might seem more like niche destinations for Chinese tourists. Um, this is in no way a, a complete picture of all of the new flight routes from China that have started since the beginning of 2018. It's just a snapshot. Um, but here you can get the idea of just how much more connected China is becoming with the rest of the world in terms of flights. Um, there are new flights to basically every single continent in the world, as well as a lot of flights that are leaving from smaller Chinese airports. So it's not just Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou anymore. Now we're seeing flights leaving from Tianjin, a lot of new flights from Chengdu, even places like Wuhan and Sanya. Um, and there are more flights on the horizon um, for later this year. I know there'll be more flights um, to and from Israel. And um, this kind of connectivity um, also brings more tourism with it. Mobile payments are something that we've already talked a lot about this year. Um, we did a webinar earlier in the year um, that was looking specifically at Chinese mobile payments. And so this is also not an exhaustive list of all of the places around the world that have added Chinese payment capabilities since the beginning of the year. But it does give you an idea of how these kind of payment platforms are really taking off on an international level. That not only is Alipay and WeChat Pay, these um, the leading Chinese mobile payments taking off around the world, but uh, Union Pay is trying to stay competitive as well, not just in terms of their card functions, but also in terms of their mobile payment solutions, which they rolled out in a number of countries around the world around Chinese New Year. Um, what's important about all of these Chinese payment solutions um, coming up around the world is not only does it make it more convenient for Chinese tourists to pay in many destinations around the world, and we've seen both from quantitative analysis as well as anecdotal evidence that Chinese tourists are more likely to spend more money when they can use um, mobile payment solutions, but these Payment platforms are also giving businesses um, a good platform for marketing, where in the Alipay app, for instance, it will have a look around function and give push notifications to users to tell them about businesses in the area that can accept Alipay. Um, or Union Pay has also done quite a lot of promotions, especially around Chinese holiday periods where you can get discounts if you use union pay at certain businesses. Um, so it's um, a good way to help Chinese consumers to pay at your business, but also even to drive them to the business in the first place. Um, obviously the World Cup has uh, recently been a very big thing in the news, um, and it's also been a very big thing for Chinese outbound tourism. According to Forward Keys, bookings to Russia were up 60% year on year uh, this June and July. Um, and I think we really have the World Cup to thank for that. Although they were just over 40,000 Chinese World Cup ticket holders, um, it was estimated that around 100,000 Chinese traveled to Russia during the World Cup even without tickets, um, just to perhaps see the games from outside the stadium or be in the World Cup atmosphere. And after the US, China was the second largest World Cup market for countries that didn't even have a team um, competing in the tournament. And because of the World Cup, this spurred businesses in Russia to become more Chinese friendly, where we had um, 4,000 Russian retail outlets start to accept Alipay, as well as five metro stations in Moscow. And all in all, Chinese tourists were expected to spend um, nearly 200 million uh, US dollars uh, in Russia during the World Cup period. What I think is also interesting to note is you can see from this infographic here um, about travel from around the world for the World Cup is that in general, only 25% of uh, World Cup ticket holders were female. Um, in China, this is a very different situation. Actually, 57% of World Cup ticket holders 
coming from China were women. Um, and this reflects the overall balance of the Chinese outbound tourism market, which is expected to be around 56% female. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's just an interesting way to see how the Chinese outbound tourism market might be different than uh, other countries. But the World Cup is really just part of sports tourism, uh, which is a very important and growing trend um, around the world and especially in China. Um, sports tourism in general is expected to be a 400 billion US dollar market by 2020. And at this point, um, China only accounts for 5% of that market, but the Chinese sports tourism market is growing at 30% per year, and there is a lot of potential here. So some of the other top spectator sports include basketball and tennis, if you go on Sea Trip, they have a special sports section where you can find packages. Um, some of them are smaller packages where you would join a group at a destination. For instance, you would meet the group in Milan and go on a tour of um, the AC Milan stadium and locker room and then see a game um, or perhaps go see something at Manchester United. Um, but then there are also full package tours um, that start from China. Um, and include a lot of things that you might expect on a normal tour of a country, but also have um, a sporting event thrown in. So, for example, this summer there were tours of France during the French Open that included tickets to see the semi-finals and finals, but also included things like going to the Eiffel Tower, shopping at Galleries Lafayette, and visiting lavender farms. So now sports are seen as an extra add-on to make some of these more typical tourism packages stand out. We're also seeing increased partnerships um, between ticketing agencies and even sports teams and Chinese OTAs. Um, but sports tourism in China is not just about going to watch big sporting events. It also has a lot to do with participation. And a recent study from China Youth Daily found that almost 80% of respondents said that they had participated in sports tourism. Now, this would include domestic as well as international sports tourism. Um, but here we can see that activities like hiking are extremely popular um, and this has a lot of potential for many destinations around the world as well. Uh, shifting gears a little bit to talk about um, more official things, um, we've seen over the years a number of countries start to relax their visa policies towards China. Um, Peru is a very good example of this as a country where um, just five to ten years ago, it took a month to get a Peruvian visa and you had to go and have an interview at the embassy. And um, starting a couple of years ago, now they have a visa waiver program where any Chinese citizen who has a visa already to the US, Canada, Australia, the Schengen area or the UK um, has a visa waiver to Peru. And then this makes it much easier for people to visit and you have a corresponding um, huge rise in tourism. Um, over the last couple of years, too, destinations like Morocco and Tunisia have become visa-free. Um, this year, and an area of the world that we think is very interesting is Eastern and Southeastern Europe. So these are European countries that are just outside the EU. Um, Serbia led the way at the beginning of 2017 by getting rid of visas for Chinese tourists. This led to a 166% year-on-year increase in Chinese arrivals. And so a lot of other countries in the region have since followed suit. So Albania went visa-free. It's um, a temporary visa-free arrangement that lasts until the end of October this year. Um, but we wouldn't be surprised if this is something that if it goes successfully, um, they would consider prolonging or making more of um, a permanent change. Uh, Bosnia has also gone visa-free for Chinese tourists starting in May of this year. And then Belarus um, went visa-free for Chinese tourists starting in June of this year. And what's especially interesting we can see on the map now is that um, how Serbia, Albania, and Bosnia are all linked up. So in the past, 
maybe even if Serbia was visa free, uh, a Chinese tourist would still want to get a Schengen visa because they wouldn't want to necessarily travel all the way to Europe um, just to go to wall one small country in southeastern Europe. But now that other countries in the area are going visa free, this really opens up the possibility for tours of those areas where um, the Chinese tourists might not worry about going to Western Europe at all. Um, so it'll be interesting to see um, in the future if more countries in that region uh, start to go visa free as well. Um, in terms of diplomatic relations, um, right now there are only a small country, uh, a small handful of countries around the world that still recognize um, the Republic of China, uh, that's the government in Taiwan, as um, the official Chinese government. And those countries can't do much in terms of attracting Chinese tourism, but those countries are um, becoming fewer and fewer. So a good example here is Panama, which established diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China just a year ago. Then they got ADS status, that's approved destination status, which means that a country can market its tourism products in China as well as accept Chinese group tourists. They got that status in November of last year, and then Air China launched a flight that goes from Beijing to Panama City in April of this year, and now they're expecting 40,000 Chinese tourists this year. And so you can see what an impact those kinds of di changing diplomatic relations can make on tourism. So this year we've had um, a few new countries um, established relationships uh, with the PRC. The first is the Dominican Republic, um, which happened on the 1st of May, and then Burkina Faso followed suit just um, a few weeks later. So with not every country will establish these diplomatic relations and then have a sudden boom in tourism, but uh, the few countries that are left that still don't have these diplomatic relationships with the PRC um, are, many of them are in Latin America and the Caribbean, and they include Belize, El Salvador, Haiti, Nicaragua, Paraguay, St. Lucia, and Honduras. And uh, I think that there is a lot of potential for tourism uh, for some of those countries, definitely. So now we'll be moving on to talk about some of the biggest digital developments in China over the past uh, six months. In terms of the online travel space, Meituan Dianping is really the company to be watching right now. And I think this is the big story uh, in terms of travel in China um, and digital travel and what's changed this year. So Meituan Dianping started as a, Meituan was a, a group buying platform and Dianping really started as a, a restaurant review and listings website. Um, but together now the company has many different apps, including apps for booking travel, um, for bike sharing, for um, the food delivery service, for booking cinema tickets. Um, so it's a very big company that has um, a lot in terms of the entertainment sphere. And they're also growing so quickly in the, um, the world of travel. So just a couple of years ago, C-Trip had well over half of all Chinese um, online hotel bookings and Meituan Dianping really wasn't on the scene at all. And then we flash forward to Q1 of this year, and suddenly Meituan Dianping has over 57% of all Chinese online hotel bookings. That includes international as well as domestic. And C-Trip is down to just over 22%. Um, so this is very surprising. Um, and again, it does, we're looking at the domestic market as well as the international market. C-Trip is still dominant in the international market. But Meituan Dianping is very aggressively moving into the international sphere as well. Um, they've got a location-based services app um, that users can use uh, when they travel abroad to find out about restaurants and book activities and attractions, uh, such as Hong Kong Disney World. Um, and they've also got a partnership with Union Pay. Um, so we would expect um, the we would expect Meituan Dianping to be growing uh, internationally as well as domestically um, in the next years. Uh, they also just recently filed for a U.S. Uh, six billion dollar IPO in Hong Kong in June, um, and if they get that, it would actually make Meituan Dianping twice the value of C Trip. 
Um, what is interesting as well is that a lot of the Meituan Dianping market is quite young. We're looking at consumers that were born in the 1990s, um, as well as those that come from lower tier cities. And this is a theme um, that will go um, throughout some of the other bigger digital developments that we'll see as well. So in terms of other rising platforms um, that are worth talking about this year, one of them is the short video program Douyin, uh, which is also known as TikTok. So this video platform has expanded um, immensely just at the beginning of this year. Um, it, as of June, they say that they have 150 million daily active users and 300 million monthly active users in China. Um, just yesterday I read that they have um, now 500 million monthly active users around the world. And you can't even download this app in the US or the UK yet. So um, those extra users are mostly in, um, in other Asian countries. And so Douyin started as, basically it's a platform where you have 15 second long videos. And they started as music videos and lip syncing and quite silly videos with puppies and things. Um, but there is potential for travel here. Um, as we can see here, there's a screenshot um, if you search Paris on Douyin and it's videos that users have made uh, when they visit Paris. Um, there are not that many international uh, travel brands that are using Douyin so far, um, but some domestic brands in China have started using Douyin. So for instance, a good example of this is the Xi'an Municipal Tourism Board. Um, they partnered with Douyin in April to launch um, a series of promoted videos and also some Douyin challenges. A challenge on Douyin is basically a viral hashtag that users use and then um, they'll make a video that goes with that hashtag. <clears throat> And then you can win a prize if you have the most popular videos that have that hashtag. Um, and so there's a lot of potential here to drive user generated content, which is something that's becoming more and more important for marketing in China and um, especially travel marketing as well. Um, Douyin, um, like Meituan Dianping, is also very young. Um, it's estimated that 72% of Chinese that were born after 1995 open Douyin every single day. Uh, another platform to talk about, which really, it doesn't have anything to do with travel, but I think is a good example of how the Chinese digital uh, world can be disrupted when you are least expecting it, is Pin Duo Duo. So this is a group buying e-commerce platform. It's mostly used by housewives in lower tier cities um, for group buying things like fruit. And it's, so it's, um, kind of small scale um, things like group buying fruit, but all of a sudden it's come and now it's rivaling the established dominant e-commerce platforms like Alibaba or JD.com or Tmall. Um, and it's the fourth most popular WeChat mini program. So I think what's interesting in all of these examples is that maybe a year ago it seemed that um, in the Chinese digital world that a lot of things were very stable. You had the big players and it seemed hard to shift them. Things like um, Tmall or Alibaba or um, even Ctrip. But we can see actually how platforms now can leverage um, just the huge number of, of population when you look at the younger generations as well as lower tier cities um, to suddenly become very big very fast. Um, mini programs um, are another thing that has developed quite a lot this year. Um, WeChat mini programs came out at the beginning of last year, and within a few months, there were a lot of naysayers that said that the mini programs weren't useful and that you didn't need to get them. And I think this has changed quite a lot since then. Um, the number of mini programs uh, on WeChat have almost doubled uh, just since January alone. And now there are over 100 million mini programs on WeChat, and they're expected to be 300 million by the end of the year. 
Um, there are also 270 million daily active users of mini programs, which is not quite as much as the nearly billion um, monthly active users on WeChat, but uh, it's still a very big number. Um, and here we've got a list of the top 15 mini programs on WeChat. Only one of them actually is a travel brand um, at number nine. Um, that is a travel search engine called Krushun. Um, which is um, coincidentally owned by Meituan Dianping, who acquired it from uh, TripAdvisor in 2015. So when many programs first started to take off, they were first embraced by retail, and then they started to quickly move into travel, and this year they've become very important for hotels. So here we have some pictures, um, examples from the Hilton mini program, which was launched in May of this year. This mini program offers services within the hotel as well as outside of the hotel. And I think it's a good example of how a hotel can use the mini program to keep engaging uh, with their consumers uh, on a deeper level um, throughout the, um, the customer's stay at the hotel. So not only can their mini program be used for services within the hotel, such as ordering room service, but they also have functions like you can see below where they'll have a map and recommendations for nearby attractions, nearby F&B and city itineraries. Um, actually, the Maritime Hotels program, which was the first international hotel to launch a WeChat mini program in March of this year, has similar functions, uh, for instance, for their Berlin Hotel, they have a number of walking routes um, that they suggest to travelers. So that way the hotel kind of stays in touch with the traveler uh, during their experience. Um, again, more and more cities are also launching their own WeChat mini programs. Uh, Vancouver announced its partnership with Tencent to launch a city mini program in June. Um, and we've just heard that Edinburgh has plans to launch um, a WeChat mini program uh, in the future as well. And so these mini programs are good examples of how travel brands are now using digital tools to stay connected to their consumers for longer in the customer journey and to interact more with their customers as well. Now it's not so much a passive experience about reading about promotions on an official account, but it's a two-way platform where brands can interact with their customers. And this is something that we're also looking at um, at Dragon Trail with a new product that we're launching called KanKan Kan Talk. We've talked quite a lot about this in past webinars and last month's webinars. We talked about its many applications for uh, hotels um, with things like room service as well, but it's also quite applicable to many different travel verticals, especially thinking about things like booking, um, as well as concierge services. Um, so that's something if you're interested in hearing about later, uh, send us an email and we can send you some more information about KanKan Talk, which is um, an AI powered uh, WeChat based chat program. Um, so now we'll finally move on to the WeChat rankings. Um, you are the first people who will be getting to see these WeChat rankings. We'll have a full report coming out on them next week. Um, but as we only just got the data a few days ago, um, here we'll give a brief summary of the top three accounts in each of the categories, um, both for the first half of the year and for the last quarter, and talk about some of the um, most successful themes and strategies of the year. So we'll start by looking at national tourism boards. This year, um, Japan has really led the way. Um, and we haven't had a huge change in the leading accounts for national tourism boards this year, except that Japan has really leapt to the top and it stayed there um, all year. Japan is a very popular uh, destination for Chinese tourists, but they've also had a very strong content strategy and picked up on a lot of the leading themes this year um, so that it's post content that people find very enjoyable. Um, what I think is interesting to point out here too is that the WeChat um, environment is becoming more crowded. There are more and more um, official accounts. And we can also see that in general, readership levels are declining on WeChat because it's becoming a more crowded environment. 
However, with some of these really successful travel brands, we're actually seeing that they're not only not losing views and followers, but they're gaining views. So um, Japan and New Zealand are two very good examples where now they have higher average views for their posts this year than they did last year. And it's a good sign that with very engaging content, um, it means that you will still um, keep getting that kind of readership. Another reason potentially that we're seeing higher readership for some of these accounts is that WeChat has adjusted the way it displays official account posts a little bit. Whereas before you would see them categorized by the account and then you'd have to go into the account to see their articles. Now the feed comes up more article by article when the article is posted. Um, and so that means if you have very engaging content with a good headline and a nice image, then it jumps out a little bit more and this can pull in more readers as well. Um, it's worth noting here that um, actually the top post by an NTO for the last quarter um, was by uh, Tourism Austria. Um, they are ranked ninth on the overall table and we'll be publishing all of those tables next week with our report. Um, but they got over 24,000 views on an article on eating and shopping at the Vienna airport. And then New Zealand also got over 24,000 views and had the second most viewed article of the quarter um, for one of its articles that had a lot of pictures of uh, stunning views of New Zealand nature. Um, New Zealand is an interesting account because they haven't changed their strategy at all since last year. They post consistently twice a week, um, which is much less than a lot of the other brands. And most, basically all of their posts are lots of beautiful, stunning pictures of nature. And obviously they found a strategy that has done very well for them and stuck with it. Um, another reason that New Zealand might be so popular is that we've seen that the Southern Hemisphere is very popular for summer travel. And New Zealand posts a lot of content that shows snowy mountains or skiing. And a recent study by Sea Trip and the China Tourism Academy found that escaping the summer heat in China is the number one motivation for outbound travel in the summer. So potentially, um, and there has been a huge increase in people looking at Southern Hemisphere destinations for their summer outbound travel. Um, so this also could be a seasonal reason that New Zealand has such a popular account. Um, moving into DMOs. Um, here again, we see that the top accounts are very similar to last year. Um, it's Hong Kong, Los Angeles, Dubai, and Macau um, are really all competing at the top, as well as some of the uh, Canadian DMOs. Um, actually, the top post of Q2 for DMOs uh, was by Edinburgh. Um, they're ranked number seven, but they got over 21,000 views for their article on filming locations around Edinburgh. Uh, then Vancouver had the second most viewed article with over 16,000 views for an article on cherry blossoms in Vancouver. Um, and then Hong Kong's top rated post with over 14, almost 15,000 views was just called Special Places in Hong Kong. Um, and we'll have more pictures and analysis of the DMO's articles uh, in our report that comes out next week. In terms of top airline accounts, again, this is very similar to last year. Um, nobody really comes close to Air Asia um, when it comes to being the top airline account. And Cebu Pacific and Cathay Pacific have just switched places since last year, when now with Cebu in second and Cathay in third. Um, but that's uh, not a massive change. Um, the airlines still mostly post about promotions, uh, but they also include some area guides. So this. Um, picture here is a good example where it was an air Asia post that promoted flights to Malaysia, but also had pictures of Malaysian specialty foods to um, entice you to visit Malaysia even more than the low prices. Uh, what's interesting is that on WeChat, we can only see up to 100,000 views. After 100,000 views, we don't know exactly how many views a post has got. Um, but the only other airline and the only other travel account in total to get over 100,000 views apart from Air Asia was Finnair. They had a very engaging campaign at the very beginning of the year where if you send them a picture of your food, 
they would find a piece of music to pair with it, which is quite a bizarre concept and not totally related to air travel. Um, but it was, um, they did it in a very engaging way that made people really want to interact with the post. And I think it went viral because of that. Um, and Finnair also did very well this year uh, with an article on how you could win free headphones. Um, it's worth noting, um, and I forgot to mention earlier that in June of this year, Finnair and Helsinki Airport celebrated the 30th anniversary of the very first direct flight between um, the PRC and Europe. Um, so that just gives us an idea of kind of how much things have progressed in the past three decades. Uh, looking at cruise accounts, uh, Royal Caribbean International has been on top for all of last year and continues to dominate this year. But there has been a, um, a big shakeup actually in the cruise lines. And we can see that as the cruise market in China is growing, it's becoming very competitive. Um, and for instance, Costa cruises used to always be at the top two. Royal Caribbean and Costa were two of the first cruise lines to enter the Chinese market and also to have WeChat accounts. And because of that, they were kind of always assured a place at the top last year, uh, but that hasn't been true for Costa this year and they've dropped uh, quite a few places. Whereas Dream Cruises has risen quite a lot. And the real success story actually, which isn't represented here in the top three is Viking Cruises. Um, they are a European river cruise uh, tour operator. And last year at this time, their posts were getting an average of just over 1,000 views per post. And now they're getting an average of um, 6,300 views per post. And some of the reasons for this is uh, European river cruising is growing in popularity. But also Viking Cruise had a very popular contest that launched at the beginning of this year. And this contest, it called for user generated content, um, which made the contest kind of go viral and it gave contestants a chance to win a river cruise for themselves and their parents to Europe. And the competition went on for quite a long time. And so it was able to generate um, just a lot of activity and that has really propelled them to do well for the rest of the year. Um, so now they're in fourth place, whereas last year they were around eighth place. Um, so it's been a quite interesting example of how an account can um, suddenly really surge to the top of these WeChat rankings. Um, from April of this year, we added two new categories to our WeChat rankings. They are museums and attractions, as well as hotels. Um, so this is the first time ever that we have quarterly data on these two uh, sectors. For um, museums and attractions, Hong Kong theme parks are very dominant. Um, they obviously have a lot of visitors and are very close by to China. Hong Kong Disneyland is by far the most popular account that we've seen for museums and attractions. But apart from Hong Kong Disneyland and Ocean Park Hong Kong, there are a lot of major museums around the world that we often see at the t near the top of the list. These include the National Gallery of Victoria in Australia, um, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, uh, which other ones are very popular, and the Louvre in Paris, as well as the Chateau Versailles um, outside of Paris. And with museums, uh, we can see a large number of views, especially for announcements about big name art shows. And these can include Chinese artists as well as well-known Western artists such as Cezanne. Um, and we'll have more analysis of that in the quarterly report that comes out next week too. In terms of hotels, uh, we already discussed some of the leading hotel WeChat strategies in our webinar last month that looked specifically at the hotel vertical. Um, here, Starwood and Marriott, I mean, they dominate hotels around the world. They're the biggest, world's biggest hotel brands, and so they're also very dominant on WeChat. Uh, hotels often use their WeChat accounts to talk about promotions for members of their loyalty uh, programs such as ways to get more points when you stay at their hotels or um, how members can get free tickets to see Chinese pop concerts. And I think that they, they use their platforms to drive interest in their loyalty programs um, and drive people to sign up for those loyalty programs and stay engaged with the hotel brand that way. 
So moving on from this, we'll look at the top themes on WeChat of this year. So last year, the top theme was overwhelmingly beautiful pictures of nature. This is what worked well across the board um, to be the kind of the most popular WeChat accounts. Um, this year, some accounts are still using pictures of beautiful nature and doing very well for it, um, like New Zealand. But I would say food is the has replaced beautiful pictures of nature this year. Food is the most prominent theme of 2018. Japan uses it all the time for their most popular posts. And food is used not only by destinations, but we also see food theme posts by airlines, by cruise lines, by hotels. There was even a museum that posted about having lunch at the museum. Um, so more and more food is one of the exciting parts about outbound tourism and something that Chinese people care a lot about when they travel abroad. Uh, and it makes for beautiful pictures as well that is very engaging. Um, after food, I would say that family uh, is the biggest theme on WeChat rankings this year. This includes traveling with children. You can see posts here from a children's playground in uh, the Royal Caribbean International Ship, as well as traveling with children in New Zealand, um, as well as traveling with elderly parents. And on the far right, we have the competition uh, with that Viking Cruises ran where you could get a free trip to Europe to travel with your parents. And the slogan for that is, um, your mom and dad took you to the world, um, now take them to see the world. Um, I think that is a, it's a very beautiful sentiment and it, it plays into how a lot of um, adults in China now are paying for their parents to go on international trips. Um, family travel, um, again, this is something that is quite seasonal. It's, um, it's an overall theme in the market, but it's quite seasonal as well, which is one of the reasons perhaps that we've seen it do so well in Q2. Um, the recent report that I mentioned earlier from CTRIP and CTA found that 58% of Chinese outbound summer travel was travel with children. Um, and um, family travel works has been used by all sorts of verticals, including destinations and airlines and hotels, but it works especially well for cruises um, because this is an area where people will often bring elderly parents or they'll travel with three generations all together and cruises have a great opportunity of showing that they have something for everyone. They have kids playgrounds, but they have um, kind of dancing competitions and music for elderly people. And so it's um, a, a relaxing way to take the whole family to travel around the world. Uh, another top theme has been flowers. This was especially prevalent in Q1, uh, but we've seen it also in Q2 and uh, starting in Q3, uh, the flower theme is still going. Flower tourism is very popular among Chinese tourists all over the world, um, from cherry blossoms in Japan to lavender fields of Provence. Um, flower tourism has been used especially well by uh, Japan's WeChat account, but we've also seen it from other accounts, including uh, British Columbia and Vancouver, as well as uh, Texas tourism. Another top theme is using celebrities. Um, so celebrities have been used last year. They were very popular, especially for DMOs partnering with these KOLs and celebrities. The celebrities are always Chinese, um, and by Chinese I mean from including greater China, Taiwan and Hong Kong as well, but they're, they're never Western celebrities and they're not even Japanese celebrities or um, South Korean celebrities. It's always um, Chinese speaking celebrities. And last year they were very popular for DMOs. Now we're seeing that they're also being they're partnering with uh, attractions as well as cruises, and there's a lot of crossover in the content. So, for instance, uh, Jackson Wong, who you can see on the left, um, he did a number of posts with Hong Kong, but some of them included him going around to eat at various Hong Kong restaurants. Or you have Zhang Liang, who did um, some promotion together with Hong Kong Disneyland, but it showed him traveling together with his son in Disneyland. Or earlier in the year, um, uh, an actor named Tao Guo did a partnership with British Columbia that showed him traveling around British Columbia with his children. So there's crossover there with food and family and other leading themes, um, but you get a celebrity to help you do it. 
Um, and so now uh, to wrap up, uh, we'll look at what is next uh, for the coming year, what kinds of themes um, we should expect and uh, what kinds of developments uh, in Chinese tourism we should expect as well. So many of these areas where we expect growth are things that have been growing for a long time and we can uh, expect them to continue to grow. So this includes independent travel, FIT, um, more interest in adventure travel and culture, more interest in new destinations and getting off the beaten track, um, as well as customized and themed tourism. So now a lot of Chinese travelers, they have the money to travel, but they're time poor. And so now they're using travel agencies to create these customized tours for them, um, as well as theme tourism. That includes things like sports tourism or wine tourism or flower tourism. European river cruises are also becoming more popular as the cruise market is expanding and maturing as well. Um, I think we'll see a rise in more in-destination digital tools. So we've already seen how WeChat mini programs are becoming bigger. Um, then we've also got Meituan Dianping and their location-based services. Um, C-Trip has their own virtual travel manager. And so uh, in all of these ways, before brands maybe used to lose the traveler when they actually went off traveling, but now there are more digital tools that keep them connected throughout the entire travel experience um, and have more touch points um, for them with um, to market various attractions and recommend things along uh, the travel experience. Um, I think we'll also see more of not necessarily big celebrities, um, but KOL and micro-influencer campaigns. Um, a very good example of all of these themes that I've talked about um, is represented in this photo here, where Dragon Trail recently sent um, two KOLs to Peru for a two-week trip, um, after which we've made um, a video series, and the first couple of those videos are now available to watch on the Dragon Trail website in the video section. And there's an article about the KOL trip to Peru as well. And so um, in this way, <clears throat> the KOLs are very good because if you see official content, um, maybe travelers, the pictures look beautiful, but they're not quite sure to believe it. Nobody they know has been to Peru. Um, they don't know what the experience would be like for a Chinese traveler. And so if you send a Chinese travel blogger or another KOL there, it kind of, they forge the path um, and they attract um, attention to the destination. Um, but they also show people that it can be done or that this destination is interesting for Chinese people to visit. And um, I think we'll expect a lot more of that in the future as people are more easily swayed by word of mouth and by people that they can trust, um, not just official websites. Uh, we should also see uh, more younger travelers. Um, obviously, the 90s generation uh, is getting older, um, but so far we've really focused a lot on the, the 1980s generation, and they're still very popular, but I think we have to focus now also on the, the 90s and post-95s. Um, as well as lower tier cities. Uh, this might be um, kind of a longer term area where we're starting to see growth uh, in travel. But in terms of marketing, it might be a good idea in, in terms of long term strategy to think about reaching out to Chinese travel agents in lower tier cities by organizing a roadshow, um, or more easily, you can organize a digital roadshow by using Dragon Trail's CTA Live platform. Um, so at this point, um, I'll move on to uh, give you a brief synopsis of our next webinar. Um, the next webinar in August, uh, it will only be at one time, as we expect a lot of people in Europe will be on holiday uh, during that time. Um, and we will be slightly focusing on the Americas, but people from other parts of the world are absolutely welcome to join. And I think a lot of the information will be relevant to all markets. Um, this will be more of an introductory webinar um, looking at Chinese tourism and digital marketing one on one. And for this webinar, we would really like to be able to answer your pressing questions about Chinese tourism and digital marketing. Um, and so we would encourage you to send any questions you have to communications at dragontrail.com. And then uh, it'll be kind of a user generated content um, crowd 
driven webinar uh, where we use uh, your questions to understand um, what you want to learn more about in terms of Chinese outbound tourism and digital marketing. Um, that's already up on our website, so you can register for it um, already. And please think about your questions and send them to us. Um, so now before we move on to the Q&A section, um, I'd just like to remind everyone that we do have quite a lot of resources uh, for free on our website, including um, articles, translated reports, infographics, um, and videos. And uh, we also have a lot of resources on our social media channels, including LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. So you can follow us on all of those if you haven't already. Um, so thank you very much. And we'll move on to the Q&A section now. Um, I will be able to respond to questions uh, as well as Roy Graff, our managing director for EM.